This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about whether we have something like 95% support for a Bitcoin soft fork. You can't have a soft fork in Bitcoin without widespread community support. So who might be in favor of large CSAM op return Bitcoin and who might be against it? Against large CSAM op return Bitcoin, I would say certainly large regulated entities like Foundry, which is the world's largest mining pool, and Mara, which is another large mining pool in the US. BlackRock, which is the world's largest Bitcoin ETF issuer. Strategy, MicroStrategy, world's largest corporate holder of Bitcoin. Coinbase, world's largest Bitcoin custodian that holds a lot of the Bitcoin for BlackRock and strategy, presumably. These companies have to be anti-CSAM for obvious legal, regulatory, public relations, and many other reasons. So who, who else might be against large opportun CSAM Bitcoin? Bitcoin Knots node runners, Precore 30 node runners, people with children, every normal human being. And then who might be in favor of large CSAM opportun Bitcoin? Maybe pervs who belong inside of a wood chipper, people running Bitcoin Core 30 today, Bitcoin Core lead maintainers who merged the op return PR and signed the release of Bitcoin Core 30, maybe other Bitcoin hardcore devs, maybe Taproot Wizards, maybe Vitalik Buterin, as Samson Mao reminds us here. This was a tweet that Vitalik deleted a few years ago. I can easily argue that one, doing heroin imposes risks on others, or two, simple possession of child porn does not. And as Adam Morgan says here, WTF. Nick Zabo took a poll on X yesterday whether CSAM and CP should be prosecuted, and 85.2% of respondents said that they should be, even when tough and costly. And this is related to Adam's discussion with Nick Zabo, in which Nick Zabo I, appears to me completely wrecks Adam. Adam writing here, someone doing something inadvisable, exposing themselves to security and complexity risks is no excuse for the Bitcoin reference client, namely Bitcoin Core, to make the same mistakes or to make other mistakes based on quote unquote urgency or expediency or prior mistake precedent, calm down. And Nick's response to Adam, yes, there is no excuse for the Bitcoin reference client to expose us to the wide variety of extreme legal risks that come with arbitrary content. You don't understand the threat environment. And I think Nick is definitely correct here. Daniel Burr responds, this is where I don't understand your position. Precedent for illegal content suggests very little legal risk related to such content under this specific fact pattern, whereas precedent for government forcing use of mechanisms for it ends for its ends, absent undue burden is proven, high risk. First of all, this is not correct about the legal precedent, but let's ignore that for now. Nick responds, what you call precedent is actually the least popular position and thus a poor guide for what the law will be in many places going forward. As this poll shows, this is really how people feel about this issue. Overwhelmingly, people agree that CSAM and CP should be prosecuted. There are many of us running knots or even pre-core 30 nodes who have significant economic incentives incentives to support 83 byte op return Bitcoin, so-called economic nodes. I'm not sure I totally like this term, but I would say here is that if there's ever a Bitcoin fork that creates two competing assets, I will certainly dump CSAM Bitcoin and buy more real Bitcoin with the proceeds. And that's one way that node runners who own Bitcoin can have a significant influence on chain splits and forks by demonetizing one side of the split. So for example, when Bcash forked from Bitcoin, if you had 10 BTC before the fork, you were then given 10 Bcash at the time of the fork on that new chain. Many Bitcoiners sold their Bcash for BTC early on, and this helped to determine the winning side. This is almost a form of economic voting. We can see here when this chart goes down, that means BTC is appreciating at the expense of Bcash. And it was a bit of a coin toss at the beginning, but then once Bcash started to lose value again, Against BTC, it basically never ended. If you're finding this video interesting so far, I'd pause really briefly here just to ask you to help to support this channel. Hit the subscribe button, that does really help. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. Now, the Bcash BTC hard fork, it's not the best example because it was, as I said, a hard fork that resulted in two different assets in BTC and Bcash. What's being talked about today in 2025 as a measure to stop large op returns from being mined included in new blocks is a soft fork. Segwit and Taproot were both non-contentious soft forks that have happened in Bitcoin's past 
and they did not result in a chain split or a new asset. Theoretically, I believe that you could have a soft fork that results in a chain split if it's contentious, but this is something we've never seen before in Bitcoin as far as I can recall. Now, what's the difference between a hard fork and a soft fork? Many of you have been asking. Hard fork is where you expand the rules to allow new things. So for example, Bcash allowed eight megabyte blocks, if I'm remembering correctly, whereas the previous cap was one megabyte blocks. Soft fork is the opposite of a hard fork. Hard fork, you expand the rules to allow more things. Soft fork, you narrow the rules. Disallowing future blocks that contain op returns greater than 83 bytes would be a narrowing of the rules and thus a soft fork. Since pre-soft fork blocks with larger op returns, op returns greater than 83 bytes, would still be accepted as valid, obviously. The kind of soft fork that I would be interested in would not disrupt blocks that had been mined in the past. They would obviously still be part of the blockchain since you can't just randomly rip stuff out of the blockchain without messing up everything else. And this is because one reason is because each block contains a hash of the previous block. And that's if you change a block's content, you change the hash and end up messing up every block, every block that comes after that. This is one of the things that Satoshi did to make sure that people can see and verify that the blocks come in a certain order. This is obviously very important. So in this vision of a soft fork that we've been talking about here today, new blocks that contain op returns greater than 83 bytes would no longer be accepted by nodes. That is new blocks would no longer be accepted by nodes running the new node software. And thus these new blocks would not be added to their versions of the blockchain. Now, would this be enough to scare Bitcoin mining pools into no longer mining blocks that contain large op returns? Because if nodes refuse to accept those blocks, then miners will be burning electricity in vain and not getting paid. Here's the question, would the large Bitcoin mining pools go along with the soft fork? That's really the $2, $2 trillion question. I think it helps ironically that Bitcoin is currently controlled by just a few large mining pools that must answer to their government masters to a certain extent. I'm not saying this is how we want it to be forever, but this is just how it is today. And I imagine that there's already huge pressure on Foundry not to mine large op return CSAM blocks. Foundry, obviously the largest American mining pool. And I would assume that large CCP mining pools in China are subject to similar CSAM prohibitions, whether legal prohibitions or certainly cultural prohibitions, but I do not know that for sure. If we take a look at the hash here, here's almost 30% of it in the US with Foundry, and then the big CC pool, the CCP pool, mining pool is Ant Pool and friends. And then a number of these other ones are also in China. So this is really, you just need a couple of these to go along with a soft fork and then it will snowball and they'll all go along with it. Mechanic writes here, time to do it again and references Shaolin Fry's tweet from August 8th, 2017. Bitcoin UASF, Bitcoin user activated soft fork. This is from the block size wars. This was a SegWit soft fork. Bitcoin UASF demonstrated that users armed with code are more, are more powerful than a billion dollar ASIC manufacturing cartel, mainly, namely Bitmain, which is who they went up against. So Mechanic here is subtly saying, time to do another user activated soft fork. So how do you do a soft fork or user activated soft fork? You get a lot of nodes to run a new version of Bitcoin software that doesn't accept new blocks that contain op returns greater than 83 bytes, for example. It doesn't need to be 100% of current nodes, but it does need to be enough nodes that it scares the mining pools into going along with the soft fork. This new node software that enforces 83 byte op returns could be a version of Knots or Core. It wouldn't really matter that much since Knots itself is already a fork or technically a mod of Core. So why couldn't we get everyone on board with the soft fork? That's what I'm asking here. Seems like Adam Back has already said many times that quote unquote, everyone hates spam. And I've already demonstrated in this video that certainly everyone hates CSAM or 99.99% of people. One way that you can help to demonstrate to large Bitcoin mining pools that we're serious about this, about no longer allowing large op returns into mine blocks. One way you can demonstrate this to the large mining pools is of course to run a Bitcoin Knots node. This helps to stop large op returns from being relayed around the network today, while also signaling an aversion to spam and thus implicit support for a soft fork that eliminates spam at the consensus level. And we can see that the number of Bitcoin Knots nodes continues to go up every day. The number of, of core nodes continues to go up, which is one reason that this percentage has been staying here right at 21, 22 percent. But I would imagine no one is really going out of their way to run Bitcoin Core 30 unless they're highly ide ideological. And many of these may turn out to be cloud nodes. So I, I really think that the power is on the side of the plebs and it's on the side of the plebs 
who are turning to Bitcoin Knots. If you want to learn how to run a Bitcoin Knots node, I'll put a link to all these free resources in the description notes below. So you can run it on your laptop, you can run it on your desktop, or perhaps the best way is to get yourself a Start9 server, a personal server, and run it on that. You can either buy one of those or build one of them, as I'll put a link to, especially this video, $275 do-it-yourself Start9 server how to set that up running Bitcoin Knots and flash it with the Start OS operating system. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.